What would you? What would some of you add to that? Huh. Okay. Let's go on to number two, KJ Nelson. Yes, sir. You are a preacher. I know you'll have to stretch and think about this. Yeah. You're you're a preacher of a congregation of two fifty. A woman comes into your office, tears coming down her face, husband reluctantly following after her. She is there for counseling, upset, looks you in the eye and says that her husband is wanting her to do things that she feels are unnatural. How do you proceed? <laughs> uh, her husband's there. Yep. Well, he better be because you don't want to be alone in the office. Just making sure. Trust me, guys. I, I know we've talked about this in some of my other yeah. classes, and I think Chuck was actually mentioned it on his test. In a counseling situation, you never, ever, 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 ever open yourself up by having a female <laughs> with you alone. You well, always either have a, a secretary or your wife or somebody around, but. I didn't know if he was actually there or if there was a secretary there. Um, uh, you, you can tell me how you would approach it either way. I don't know, Brian. I don't know. <laughs> okay, you have not helped this woman at all. Now she's really crying. <laughs> well... Give you one phone a friend. You can find somebody in the class who you would call John Warren at their office in a church setting. John Warrens. I would call them John Warrens. John Warrens. How would you proceed, <laughs> brother? He's going to get my voicemail. Well, all right. Now, if he's reluctantly come, come uh, with her, I'm going to sit them down both, and I might even just get some in, in, initial information from them and set up a counseling session to where I'm going to have, uh, if they are open to both of them coming to a counseling session, I will have my wife there with me. and we can Absolutely. Go. Or uh, I will have my wife with her, and I will take him separately, and we'll discuss his issues, and she can discuss issues with the, uh, the wife. But um, uh, definitely have uh, uh, my wife there with me and, and take off from there whatever, you know, whatever way they want to. If they're willing to counsel with us to work out their marriage, uh, I'm always uh, thinking my wife has got great answers for women because I'm not going to have them. Um, okay. With, regarding their issues, uh, okay. specific issues uh, that I cannot relate to. Um, and I trust my wife and, and, and her uh, judgment and her experience. So, and I'll, cause I think I can relate with the guy as far as, uh, or maybe, maybe not, but uh, at least we can work it out, uh, you know, testosterone to testosterone, you know, so we can, we can, we can talk it out. So, all right. But definitely got to get them to, to buy into the counseling, especially the reluctant uh, husband. Um, apply some pressure to him to, to sit down with me and, because it, it might be all, you know, the, the issue might be 90% his problem, but still there's going to be a, a portion that she's got to, she, she's got to uh, be willing to, to be a part of the, the counseling. Okay. The counseling too. Okay. Mr. Kader. Kind of rectify myself a little bit here. Um, <laughs> we might talk about, actually Emily just whispered this in my ear, so not really, but um, we might talk about, respect issues maybe for um, how to properly love your wife and how to properly respect your husband. Because um, re recently Emily and I read the Love and Respect book. It's, it's fairly popular. And I might go through that book with them as well because it's, it's really good. Um, okay. And just just talk about the husband's needs versus the wife's needs and how, how those can be rectified together. And... Um, Okay, let me ask this question because you guys are, are, are doing a great job of tiptoeing around it. Are there things that God has said are unnatural? Yes. Absolutely. And I'll give you a prime example is 
If your spouse says, hey, I, I really think it would be fun if we included an animal into the bedroom scene, that's not exactly a normal situation. Even though the husband is the head of the wife, that does not allow him to violate biblical principles of what God has set forth for marriage. Dustin. Um, how would you ask that? How would you ask them what exactly is inappropriate without being risque? I mean, because I, I, you need to make sure that what he's asking is truly inappropriate. She just might not have the sex drive he has, right. and he just wants it more, which is natural, and that might be a whole different situation than, like... Right, and about. that's... That's why I think what both these, John and, and KJ, talking about bringing in wives and talking about respect, that's why it's going to be so important <clears throat> to have both of them sitting there. And basically what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to strip back all the way back to the core of their relationship and say, okay, what, what do you as a wife feel like is a normal, healthy relationship and Husband, what do you feel like is a normal, healthy relationship? And then come forward from that. And usually, you know, in the course of the conversation, it's going to come out pretty quickly. You know, if, if you get he or her talking, one of them very quickly is going to say, well, you know, they think that it's wrong to do this or, or he wants me to do X. Well, all of a sudden they have kind of laid down their cards and shown you what they feel like is either unnatural or unethical or immoral or whatever. All right, Mr. Quentin, you're up, brother. Uh, you are a preacher for a congregation, and you find out through the grapevine that one of your elders has a membership to Ashley Madison. What do you do? What's Ashley Madison? <clears throat> Ashley Madison. Let me put it on the screen. Ashley Madison would be the website, Life is Short, Have an Affair. Oh, oh man. <laughs> they have 5,580,000 anonymous members, and their job, believe it or not, is actually to set up affairs. Um, in fact, if you read down through here, they talk about... How do you do it? What's, how much does it cost? Um, I love this. Do they, you ask, uh, does Ashley, Ashley Madison encourage infidelity? No, does not encourage anyone to stray. In fact, if you're having difficulty, you should seek counseling. However, if you still feel that you'll seek a person other than your partner to fulfill your unmet needs, then we truly believe that our service is the best place to start. At Ashley Madison, you can communicate with other like-minded adults who may be more sympathetic to your circumstances. Never compromise your safety, privacy, or security. We'll never have to reveal your identity unless you choose to. You can go at your own pace and change your mind anytime you want to. Um, notice this one. Does a service like Ashley Madison make it easier for people to stray? Of course not. People don't stray because it's easier convenient. Most stray because they're missing something in their relationship they feel they need or deserve more than their primary partner offers. Providing a service like ours does not make someone more likely to stray any more than increasing the availability of glassware contributes to alcoholism. That's incredible. Uh, the next one, why, why does Ashley Madison offer an outlet for people that don't care about their spouses? Unfortunately, stereotype about flanders abound. Most unfaithful people do care about their spouse will take steps to work out the problem. Our role is to keep them from taking unnecessary risk while they explore the feelings that they got they got them to our website to begin with. I love the last the, <coughs> notice this one. The website seems like a radical idea. What do people have to say about it? Public opinion is clearly in favor of free and democratic society that lets people do as they wish, including signing our service to have an affair. A recent survey suggested as many as 75% of those polls believe that while cheating was inherently wrong, we should still have the right as a free society to make up our own minds. Back to you, Mr. Quentin. Um, I would ask, you say he's my elder or a deacon? 
He's one of your elders. Alright, I'll say Mr. Ed, that's his name. Mr. Ed, um, are you a Christian? He would say yes. I'd say, do you love God? He would say yes. Do you believe that a Christian reputation and the name that he makes for himself is important? He would say yes. And then I would say, I've heard something about you, and if you're a Christian like you say you are, why has this come up? Well, what has come up? Well, I hear you're a member for Ashley Madison. He says, no. I said, well, I believe you, but I want to tell you this. You're an elder. You're watching over people's souls. If you can't look at, if you can't, if you cannot uh, manage your own soul, then you need to step. You would need to step down. And if you're cheating on your wife mentally, possibly physically, you will go to hell for doing so. Okay. What would you guys add to that? I would go to the qualifications of an elder. Um, there you go. Okay. Above reproach, prudent, uh, uh, prudent, respectable, and Ashley Madison, and and even the appearance of his name with Ashley Madison would not be respectable. It wouldn't be prudent, and he wouldn't be above reproach. Okay. I, I was I was and to add to that. I would say not even not even an elder, a Christian, shouldn't even be like that. And I believe an elder. Absolutely. Is I mean. I, I threw Elder at you just because that makes it a little more sticky in that technically he can kind of be viewed as your boss. But, Chris. Don't you also need to bring in the individual who is, who is making the accusation? Absolutely you do. Because, well, especially if that is an Elder, you can't, you can't call an Elder without having the, the people there. John, you had a comment before I say something? Same thing. <clears throat> I'm not going to receive an accusation against an elder without getting it cleared up from that individual first. Um, right. So, listen, you know, I mean, do you understand what you're saying? <laughs> and in this case, guys, because this is an anonymous site, what it would what it would require is somebody of the opposite sex basically chatting and either printing out pictures of this guy or a chat line discussion or whatever. But here, here's a totally separate question. What is it saying about our society, ethically speaking, when you have a website that is boasting five and a half million people who have signed up for the potential to have affairs? Marriage is no longer sanctified. Well, I think it says that the, internet, the anonymity of the Internet has made... Um, all forms of sexual immorality more palatable and more acceptable for a wider group of people, including members of the Lord's Church. What else? That we're in a danger do you do you view this as part of the overall barometer of our society? And by that I mean you know, if, if, if you look back 25 years ago, do you think 25 years ago our society was in the same position, morally speaking, that we are today where this is looked at as not just acceptable, it is so acceptable they got five and a half million people. You know, 50 years ago, I honestly think if somebody had tried this 50 years ago, probably society would have stepped up and said, look, this is blatantly wrong, and they probably would have done enough enough pressure to put them out of business. Today, they don't put them out of business. They actually increase their business. <clears throat> totally different scenario. Well, people, I think the society today is taking uh, free will out of context and out of hand, in my mind. It's all about free will. I can do what I want to do. I'm not hurting you, and if you want to be a part of it, you can. If not, then fine. True. It's your choice. Ultimately, God gave us free will. Why? Because he loved us so much. I mean, could he have made us, you know, automatic? Absolutely. But he loved us so much, he gave every single person free will. Uh, okay.
<clears throat> one, one more. Ah, uh, let's see who I haven't picked on. Dan, I haven't picked on you today. Let's say that you, do you have a daughter by chance? Yes, I do. All right. You got a daughter who goes to a, a Girl Scout meeting. And as you are dropping her off, they close the door and let you know that in this particular meeting that no parents are allowed. And when your daughter comes home, you find out that she has been given a brochure that looks just like the one coming up on the screen. Um, you start flipping through this particular brochure. And you realize it is teaching your child about sexual ethics, specifically about HIV. So your daughter goes to Girl Scout <clears throat> to a meeting, and what they realistically got was a, a sex ed talk that talked about people living with HIV virus. So as you open this particular brochure, you notice things like <clears throat> young people living with HIV may feel sex is, is just not an option, but don't worry, many young people living with HIV live healthy, fun, happy, and sexually fulfilling lives. You too if you want to, you can too if you want to. Things get easier and sex can even get better as you become more comfortable with your status. You go on to look through this particular little guide and you realize that your daughter who is only 13 years of age was sitting through a talk where it is talking about not only sex being pleasurable, but also talking about it's okay if you have multiple partners because HIV is not a curse. It's not a the death sentence that, that many people basically would like them to believe. How do you respond? And by the way, guys, this, what I'm telling you, is a real-life deal. This is actually a brochure that was given to uh, Girl Scouts in a basically a, a big sex ed, sex ed campaign. Um, Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts. My daughter will not be in Girl Scouts. Well, I guess. How would you uh, How would you respond? Man, I guess the the uh, wow. Uh, I would hope, I guess, at, at 13, that I would have already that she would already know. How the sanctity of her body and and God go hand in hand, I guess, uh, to be able to. I, I man, I don't know, Brad. <laughs> other than okay. other than that, other than it shouldn't. Wow. <laughs> uh, Dan, you're not helping your daughter, brother. I know. I KJ, <laughs> I was just going to. Uh, your that. daughter, your daughter, and KJ's. The people that came to visit him are in the same boat right now. They're just like floating out there. Come on, just... I fix that. I, got, I, just, I, would, I would think that. I know. I would. I would. Uh, well, I would. I would. I would hope. You know, this that that she knows that that that's just by the end of it, that's not that. I don't know. <laughs> hey, uh, let me get. Let me back up. Would you actually go to? The Girl Scout folks. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, we're, now we're getting somewhere. Yeah, okay. I would. I would. Yeah, that's because that's not their. That's that's not their uh, number one. That's not the. That's not the. To just pop that on on a meeting, if number one, you would have to question their. What is it? Their their yeah their motives for having a a non-announced closed door meeting with girls. Of that age, anyway, like that. Uh, which they literally did, by the way. Um, well, are we all in agreement that that our society has got s some like pretty it? bad uh, standards when it comes to sexual ethics? <clears throat> I mean, when you look at what, for instance, television is promoting when it comes to sex between adults or not even adults at this stage. When you look at things like the divorce rate, when you look at things like homosexual agenda, 
Are we all in agreement that the standard of right and wrong has been so muddied and grayed and messed up that as preachers, teachers, and Christians, we got a, a pretty big job in front of us of going back and teaching what is right. Yeah, even within the church. <clears throat> even within the church. And let's, let's start there. Um, one of the things where I think we mess up a lot is we basically – hammer the idea of just abstinence so hard into the hearts and the minds of our kids that when they finally get married, what happens? They're scared of it. They're scared of it. It's dirty. Absolutely. They're scared of it. So it's almost, we almost in a way do ourselves a disfavor because young people growing up, they, they don't view sex as being good from God. And so that, they kind of start their marriage off in a really twisted particular way. What I want us to do, we're going to look at three or four main things. We're going to start just by looking at where our society is today. Um, if you think about it for just a moment, I don't think it's a, a secret to anybody that the mainstream media is really pushing the sexualization of America. And because of that, think about what it's doing ethically to our perception how, how old do you think the normal person is in an advertising for clothing? 15, Somewhere in the 15 to 17 range. And what kind of poses are those folks doing? Sexual. Seduction. Exceptionally sexual. So <clears throat> let's look for just a minute. This is a, uh, a book that was assigned in New York School Board. They they got on to a high school English teacher for ripping out pages of this book, Girl Interrupted. The teacher did it because of the explicit sexual references. And yet the school board comes back and says, you should not have taken those out of the book. You should have left the book intact. How do you respond to that? Why do you want it kept in? Not just why do you want it kept in. Why are we reading it? Yeah. Why are we reading it, guys? What purpose is there in having that as a part of? Is that like an assignment? Why in the world? In a library? Or... Wow. Why are we exposing? This is high school. Why are we exposing high school girls and guys to books that have any kind of explicit sexual references in the first place? Past week, the University of Cincinnati announced a campus activity called UC Sexploration Week. It was sponsored by Pure Romance and the University of Cincinnati Wellness Center. Then featured lectures by so-called sex experts, free sex kit giveaways, and pizza and porn night. That's incredible. This is unreal. The Wellness Center Program Director Reagan Johnson said, we're using this to showcase that porn is not necessarily a bad thing. <clears throat> they call, uh, the week was called Sex Capades. Participants were invited to test their sex marks in a series of physical, mental challenges and to win great prizes. So when you look at what's going on with our society, you've got sexualization in America that is attacking all different aspects of a person's existence. It's, it is affecting our intellectual abilities, the psychological abilities, it's causing some people some pretty major physical problems. Sexualization is defined as a person's value <clears throat> coming only from his or her sexual appeal or behavior. To the exclusion of any other characteristics, personal is, it, is sexually objectified. How can that mess up our view of ethics in this area? Sean, Sean got that was a question. How can it not? Yeah, Sean had a good answer. How can it not? <laughs> okay. I mean, if basically, if you believe your total existence, the sum of your existence is for one thing and one thing only, do you not think it's going to pretty much taint your overall standard of what is right and wrong? So we, we, we look at that and we say, okay, how did we get here? In the United States of America, what are some of the components? Obviously, one of the, the main ones would be the Internet. Has the Internet 
played a major role in redefining sexual ethics in America. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. Like videotapes, DVDs, the Internet has proven popular for the distribution of pornography because it allows people to view pornography anonymously in their homes. also allows access to pornography by people whose access is otherwise restricted. Here are the statistics, guys. When you look at how many web pages there are for some of these things, notice the tremendous difference between, say, politics and sex or you know, anything, it is clearly leading the, the case all the way around. In fact, this should make you sick right here. 89% of all the porn in the United States is, or 89% of the porn, period, is created in the United States. 89%. And yet we have the audacity to keep saying God bless America. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by 89% of porn is created like you're counting America, Asia, all the whole world. I'm talking out of the entire earth, 89% of the porn that is put onto DVDs or movies is actually filmed and produced in the United States. Well, Brad, don't we have some of the, don't we have some of the most permissive laws with regard to pornography on earth as well? Absolutely. In fact, there's about a four-mile square radius area in the state of California where it is, it is absolutely sick how much they are generating in that little four-mile area. <clears throat> you got $2.84 billion in revenue is generated from U.S. porn sites in 06. Basically, $89 per second is spent on pornography. 72% of the viewers are men. Obviously, that would leave the rest being female. Look at this, guys. 260 new sites go up daily. Now, part of that is not brand new sites. Part of that is them spamming legitimate websites. And I'll give you a for instance. Uh, our website is focuspress.org. So let's say that they realize, hey, we're a Christian-based company. We're getting a lot of traffic. They want to, to try to pull some Christian men away, so they buy FocusPress.com. And they, they mirror one of their porn sites to it. They actually did this with uh, those of you who heard about it about five or ten years ago. There's a website. It's, I think it's just WhiteHouse.gov, and they captured WhiteHouse.com, and it was actually a porn site. 5% of all Internet sites are pornographic, 12%. Now, how does that mess up ethics? When you figure the average age of the first Internet exposure to porn is 11, then all of a sudden you realize children are getting involved in this. Largest consumer of Internet porn it would be people who are 12 to 17. 15 to 17 year olds having multiple hardcore exposures would be 80% of those kids. That means if you go into a public school classroom, <clears throat> statistically speaking, 80% of the kids have had multiple exposures to a hardcore porn site. 90% of 8 to 16 year olds have viewed porn online, most while doing homework. Seven to 17 year olds who freely given out their home address would be 29%. Uh, freely given out their email address, 14%. Children's characters linked to thousands of porn sites. This is where they grab things like Pokemon or um, Backyardians or some of these popular kids' things and they tie them purposely to a porn site. And yet, here's what we got to keep in our minds. Inspired psalmist said, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Paul, in writing to the Christians at Corinth, he says, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife. Let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. So does the Bible have a standard that we should be following when it comes to this, absolutely. And yet, here's, this will be a quote from Joe Francis. 
Notice what he says. This is when the economy fell off recently. He goes to our Congress. He says the U.S. government should actively support the adult industry's survival and growth just as it feels the need to support any other industry cherished by the American people. Wow. They wanted a bailout, guys. What? In fact, Larry Flint, who is, uh, I don't remember which porn magazine he owns, but he goes to Congress and he says that Americans are too depressed to be sexually active. It's time for Congress to rejuvenate the sexual appetite of America. They were asking for $5 billion, the American porn industry, because they said that's what they'd lost due to the poor economy. Some of you guys are actually watching what is going on right now in China. China's got a big issue because they finally opened up their Internet and allowed Google to come in. But here's the interesting thing. Google... When they went to China, they actually put a filter on themselves, meaning they basically said, okay, Chinese government said, we don't want our citizens exposed to pornography. Google says, okay, we'll put a filter on, and they did for the first year. Well, now Google's saying, we want to take that off, and the Chinese government's saying, uh-uh, you can't do that. Now, do you not find it a little bit ironic that the Chinese government doesn't want their society exposed to this, and yet an American company named Google has the same search engine here but without any filters? That's where we are today. So would this involve, now, would this involve money? Is that kind of what this is going uh, does it involve money? If you added up every pro sport in the United States, take all the money generated by every pro sport, you still would not reach how much money porn is bringing in. So does that have anything to do with money? Yeah, you better believe it. All right, let's stop for, right here for just a minute. Chuck, you're a preacher. How do you address... What the Internet has done ethically to the American family when it comes to sexual ethics. What do you, what do you say from a pulpit? Well, I think first I have to be very careful about the words that I choose to use. Um, Absolutely. But um, in essence, I would address it as uh, uh, it's, over, it's overstepped. Um, the parents' authority and their role um, as, as, as parents and as caretakers to their children because um, you have these great things on the Internet that, that uh, uh, can actually nourish a child and they can, uh, they, they can actually keep the child. But then where our, I don't want to say depraved minds, but our... Um, our fleshly minds kind of come in. Um, we have this natural curiosity, and the internet kind of feeds that. You know, we start from from a good state, and then we have this natural curiosity, and the internet kind of provides us an outlet. And I don't know how how specific you can get. Okay, let me ask this. Is it ridiculous for a church to look at having somebody come and maybe Sunday night at a fellowship meal have somebody come and discuss a filter like Be Safe Online? Chris. Right. <clears throat> One of the things that I was just about to say is that I think it's res the responsible thing for us as, as men who are going to preach in the 21st century is to be aware ourselves of what sorts of technologies are out there to, to provide, to, to, to give to the congregation, because there's going to be that need. We should we should know what these filter programs are. We should know what the ones are that are most the point. That, are, that they cost the least amount of them, the most affordable. And it's, it's information that people are going to need. 
and we need to be in a position to be able to give it to them. Absolutely. Because part of, part of the job of elders and preachers is to make sure that the congregation is being fed spiritually, the right foods. And part of that, that spiritual feeding goes along with what are they allowing into their home. And if you know of certain products that are going to help them stay spiritually pure and, and not get sick spiritually, then I think we have an obligation to make sure that people understand and know about them. There's a lot of stuff available out there. The problem is a lot of times Christians don't know that it actually exists. They should be on our websites, too. Sean. Wow. Do you have a list of some of those filters that we can actually tell people about? Because that would be pretty helpful. Very helpful. Extremely helpful. In fact, I think that it would be very, very wise for preachers to know not only the filters, to know places like media um, review places, sites like Kids in Mind or, or uh, Screen It, plugged in online, so that you can either from the pulpit, from a bulletin, from a, a parent team meeting, you can say, here are resources you guys can use. Chris brought up technology. One of the big problems that we're facing right now, believe it or not, even in the church, is actually this allele. Somebody tell me what is the rage right now with teens? Sex texting. Sexting. Absolutely. Sexting or whatever it's called. Take a look. Here is a results from a survey with teens and young adults. You've got 20% who say they have sent or posted online nude or semi-nude pictures or video. You've got 39% who have received or sent sexually suggested material. you got 48% who reported receiving a sexually suggested message. Look at those numbers for just a second, guys, and then think with me for just a moment. When it comes to pictures, What's the problem with, well, I mean, multiple problems. You've got, obviously, uh, biblical, scriptural problems. But legally, what is the problem with a teenager sending naked pictures of themselves? It's underage porn. Kitty porn. They are, ch they are transferring child pornography. That is against the law in every state. And if they get caught, that's serious time. We ask the question, we say, okay, who are they actually sexting? In this particular survey, number one answer was boyfriend or girlfriend. Number two answer, somebody for a, quote, hookup. Or number three, somebody they know only, only on online. What's the problem with all three of these? They lead to the real thing. Okay, definitely can lead to the real thing. All of them are immoral. Every, guys, do you see marriage or a spouse in any of that? No. No. Oh. So, again, ethically speaking, our society has said, you know what, this is a gray area. It's not that really all that important. We ask the question, why did they do it? Here's what they said. To be fun, flirtatious, as a sexy present, uh, some of them would send responses to receiving a message. Some would do it as a joke, others to feel sexy, others because they pressured. <clears throat> In fact, here's a, uh, here's a response that was given. It says, I honestly think it's not smart, but if you're totally into the guy, you love him, he loves you, then there's no harm. Yeah, I agree with people. If you got it, flaunt it, it but don't go all naked and slutty. I would just be careful about how much you give the camera. Laughing out loud, yes, I've done it, and I'm not upset. Now, keep that in mind and check out the next quote, who is from a parent. He says, I wish I had a cell phone to do that when I was a teenager. My three kids all have cell phones. Only one abuses it. That's because he has a girlfriend. I still see no harm in sending these pics as long as it's between a girlfriend and a boyfriend. <laughs> so... Maybe they don't understand it. Maybe they don't understand what's going on. No. Okay, what what should they understand, Dustin? What's I mean, ethically speaking? Say what? I think they should understand what's truly what truly sexting is or whatever they call it. I don't. Maybe it. I don't know. I don't know. 
Sorry, I'm going to get off on a tangent because this is a pet peeve. So, better just move on. <laughs> no, it should be a pet peeve because, guys, we got a lot of young people in the church uh, yeah. who are struggling with what we're talking about. And I know, it, was it Chris Was it Chris or Dustin? Which one of you guys worked with youth? Both of you? I did. Well, I think we both did. Yeah. Both of you. Okay. You guys know if the teens in your congregation were totally 100% honest with you, you're going to have teens that are struggling with Internet porn problems and teens that have either sent or received these kinds of messages on their phone. Yep. The problem is society is telling them it's not that big a deal. How do we convey that it is a big deal? There's a number of different things you do. You go to Scripture. You, you share with them the sort of the practical things that can go wrong. Okay. And that are wrong. You're doing this sort of thing. That you share with them the child pornography aspect of it, the consequences of that. Um, but you always bring it back to the Bible. Always, always. But Chris, Chris, here's where part of your uphill struggle is. A girl takes a picture of herself, basically where you can't see everything, but you can. There's enough there. And when you confront her about it, her first response is going to be, "There's nothing wrong with that. That's we see that on TV all the time." Well, the problem with that is, why are you watching that on TV all the time? There you go. So our society standard is pretty screwed up, if you really think about it. John, you had a comment. I was just going to say, add to that, that it's not going to stop at just that activity. It's going to continue to progress. Yeah. It'll develop into, if, it, if it's not controlled, if it's not shut out of your life, if it's not thrown out of your life, it'll continue to progress into an addiction. Um, yep. And you cannot stop, you know, it's something where you can't stop. I mean, God could stop it, but... Uh, only with your desire to. Yep. There's no difference. In All right. In addition to that, now we're, we're going to stick on the kids for just a minute. How about this one? Is there a problem with sexual ethics in video games? Yep. Let me ask this question. Um... 38% of female characters scantily clad. Let me go ahead and go through the, the stats just so you guys are familiar with them first. <clears throat> you got 31% of the characters exposed stomach or midriff, 31 exposed thighs, 23% uh, their breast or cleavage, 15% their rear ends. What they found in the year 2007 was this. Of the young people who had a, a high sexual media diet when they were 12 to 14, they were more than twice as likely as those with the less exposure to sex in the media to have sexual intercourse later. In other words, there's a direct correlation of how much of this you're getting to how much you're actually going to be doing later on. Somebody name me a video game example of what I'm talking about. Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. Yeah. Grand Theft Auto. What is, how are females treated in Grand Theft Auto? Like objects. As a way to get points. As a way to get points, as objects. Guys, I know most of you have probably played it. Uh, John Warren's maybe being an exception. John, video games are something that you play on a computer or on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so let's talk more about them later, brother. That's Atari, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, kind of like Atari, yeah, yeah. Um, let's let's go back to Chris. Let's go back to Chris and Dustin for just a second. You guys have had some experience with young people. Tell me this: How much do you think? How how many out of a given week? How many hours do you think a thirteen to fifteen year old puts in? Playing video games. That's, that's more than they do studying the Bible. And more than they do studying their, their, their anything else, <laughs> including their scores. The, the question, the thing that I have, the question that I have, is okay. sort of high sexual media diet, twelve to fifteen. Yes. 
in order for a 12 to 14 year old to have a high sexual media diet, there has to be either a lack of parental involvement or a negative sort of parental involvement. I've got one of the kids in my youth group whose mother bought him an Xbox to buy him a video game by 50 Cent, the rapper 50 Cent. Okay. Bought him that video game for Christmas. The kid was 13 years old. And the rating on that particular game was M for mature only, mature audiences only. Yeah, R for ridiculous. And you've got either that or you've got parents that are paying attention. You're either living in a nice little bubble or you haven't really thought about what's going on in the church. No, I'm well aware of what's going on. Would you say in the church that we still have a problem with kids, teenagers, coming home to a two-parent family where both parents work outside the home? Right. I didn't grow up in that kind of home. I'm, I'm well aware, of it, but it, it's, it doesn't mean that I don't. It doesn't make me angry. No, no. I'm saying I'm, I'm trying to get you to understand how they can have a high diet, high media diet. If, if your parents don't come home until five. Mm-hmm. So you've got from three to five to do or watch whatever you want. Mom, dad comes home, they eat a meal. Then what do we do at night? We turn on television. Yeah. It's everywhere. It's, it's, it's right. Everywhere. Parents need to. They need to be savvy as well. They need to be absolutely to make sure that they get themselves up to date on what's going on, what, what what sort of technology exists out there, what their kids are paying attention to, and how tech savvy their kids are, so that absolutely. they can spread pace with their children, if not stay a step ahead of them. Let me give you guys an example. Um, my wife and I, we, we, we consider ourselves pretty pretty much media Nazis at our house. <laughs> but even the the even some of the shows that we tried you know, tried to watch or, or tried to sit around the family, I'm gonna give you an example. Um, there was a show Deal or No Deal that came out three years ago. When it originally came out, neat show, fun show. What happened to the ladies who were holding the numbers on that show? Well, that's the last one. Yeah, they stopped holding as much on their... They go from, like, normal human beings to these supermodels who are wearing nothing. And so, as a Christian family, we don't watch that show anymore. It's gone, gone. But you'd be blown away as to how many young people and adults are familiar with, like, the storylines of Desperate Housewives, of the Kardashian gang, of a lot of the shows on VH1 or MTV, <laughs> some of the reality shows that are absolute garbage. Yep. Absolutely. And yet we justify it as, as, well, it's okay, it's just entertainment, it's all right. That's the problem, it is entertainment. Well, and that, that's either parents who are desensitized themselves or who are, or who are not aware of what those shows contain. Right. You know, when I, was, Sorry, Chris, go ahead. You know, when I was growing up, I got away with watching MTV until such time as my mom figured out what MTV was all about. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, well, music television, hey, that's harmless, right? Who doesn't love music? Right. You know what I mean? But then once you figure out what about music. music. Exactly. I mean, you have to you have to actually be savvy. You have to know what's going on, and that and that requires a certain amount of exposure to it yourself. I mean, not going on right. pornography websites, but you need there are those websites out there that, that, that kind of tell parents what what the, the latest slang is, the street slang is for drugs, and parents right. need to read that stuff and they need to know what that stuff is. Absolutely. For forewarned is forearmed. KJ, I think a lot of the problem is parents want to give their kids. Everything, and they don't want to. They don't want to limit their their children to what they can and can't have. And if all the kids in their class have a cell phone, then they're gonna go to mom and be like, "No, I want a cell phone. I want a cell phone." And then they're gonna give into that. And then the next thing you know, they're doing this for themselves. And if we could just, it would be easier if we could just limit our our children to. Not that I have any, but um, <laughs> limit them to what they actually need 
and then that, that'll take some of the temptation away. Because they don't need a laptop in their room, or they don't need a TV in their room to, to um, be able to do their homework. All right, let me see. Let me see who can fill out this Bible passage. A child left unto himself does what? Gets in trouble. Mischievous. Bring forth what to his mother? The word is shame. A child left unto himself bringeth forth shame to his mother. The guys, we've seen that over and over and over, where you leave children alone, their natural tendency is not going to be to be little angels that sit on a couch and read Tom Sawyer. They've got to be trained. They've got to be nurtured. They've got to be brought up, and they have to have a conscience that is seared into them. Dustin. Okay. We need to be real with ourselves. Because it's not an ideal world. And if we go around thinking, well, I'm not going to give my son or daughter a cell phone because that's going to keep them out of it, that's a different story. I'm not going to give my son or daughter the Internet access because that's going to keep them out of trouble, that's a different story. Uh, I have a daughter that learned to walk, I don't know, three months ago. And I had a choice of I can cover all of the sharp corners in my house with, with uh, foam so if she falls, she's never going to get hurt. Or I could be the parent that's there with her, teaching her how to walk, keeping her away from that stuff, and helping her along the way so she's learning about the stuff as we go, instead of totally keeping her out of it so one day she hits her head on that because she doesn't understand what that is. And that's the problem. We can, I had, I, every other month back at home with the youth group, I would meet with the parents and keep them on the down low. Um, of what was going and that's what we called the meetings and that's what we would do is to keep them up to date to keep their children away from that stuff instead of masking that stuff from their children well I believe it or not I'm actually going to agree with both you and KJ in that I think it's very important you're a proactive parent no, I'm not going you, to guess what he said I'm just sorry I, no, I wanted to come off here's what I'm saying later. Right. Number one, you've got to teach your child how to make responsible choices right. and decisions and be a parent. But number two, there's no, no need to introduce your child to some of this garbage early in their life just because right. the rest of society is doing it. Emily, you got to come in, then we got to move on. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think as parents, it's your responsibility to guard your home and to shield it, protect it, and... Um, like just using clear play, having um, the computer in a common area, I think that's, you're not completely shielding them from it, but you're monitoring it, and I think that's important. Yep, absolutely. All right, let's do a quick little test. If I were to say uh, there's a commercial with two people in a bathtub outside, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay. guys commercials nowadays are pushing the boundaries when it comes to uh, se sexual ethics my thankfully my kids are not old enough to understand what erectile dysfunction is but it drives me crazy that about every 10th commercial that's what they're getting to see although we kind of mute it and we do we don't do live TV at our house the point being, when you are at home, let's say you finally find a wholesome program, whatever it is, good luck, but let's say you actually find one, you still have to wrestle with what are the commercials going to show my kids? Because nowadays commercials can be just as erotic or just as suggestive as some of the other stuff. 25% of TV commercials send some kind of attractive message telling viewers what it is, and what is not attractive. Now, so we kind of laid the groundwork. Let's look for just a minute at what Hollywood, what kind of message they're sending when it comes to ethics. Most of you probably know of a singer named Britney Spears, has a sister named Jamie Lynn, a younger sister, who about six months ago had a child. My understanding is that she was 16 when she got pregnant. She was interviewed by OK Magazine, glamorizing teen pregnancy. She released pictures to the magazine talking about how wonderful it is, saying nothing about the difficulties 
basically viewing this as a positive and defining moment of their lives. Um, so a lot of teens will look at this and say, we've been lied to. They're going to believe that you can have a baby, feel loved, and you can have sex now. There's no reason to wait. So think for just a moment about what kids are seeing when they look at the periodicals. Believe it or not, these are the clean ones. There were some I could not even I could show. I, Cosmopolitan, I'm sorry, if you guys get that in your home, shame on you, because it's just hideous. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2 and 3, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, let each woman have her own husband, let the husband render to his wife the due affection, due to her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. What about the merchandise? How has that changed us into sexual beings? How many of you guys are familiar with Abercrombie and Fitch? I'm sure most of you are. Let me just say, if I, if I come to Denver and I catch you guys walking through that store, you're going to get a minus 10 on your next test. They sold, look, they sold underwear to little girls. This was thong underwear with phrases like eye candy and wink wink on it. Guys, why would you do that? To sexualize children. This is disgusting. Absolutely. Look at how we're dressing kids. This would be Beyonce's clothing line. Now think about that for just a minute. Those little girls are dressing basically like pop stars. And yet, we've forgotten what the Bible says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you may abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you may know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. In fact, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators, adulterers, God will ultimately judge. Now, somebody tell me what agenda has probably done the most damage when it comes to sexual ethics in America. The role model agenda. Can you repeat that again, Brad? I'm sorry. Do you a lobby, like a political lobby, or what? Yeah. What what agenda or what lobbyists have done the most damage? Gay rights. Yeah, homosexuals. Homosexuals. What is the, the underlying, I mean, obviously they are promoting homosexual rights and gay marriage, but ultimately what are they trying to communicate to our society overall? Promiscuity. Everything's okay. Yeah. Anything goes. Because if anything goes, that means their immoral behavior also goes. Um, how many of you in here have heard of, let me put this on the screen while I'm talking, how many of you in here have heard of people trying to use homosexuality as a civil rights issue? Okay. What do you think is their argument there? I mean, what are they ultimately trying to say? They were born that way. Yeah. There's a they were born that way. Now, think about that for just a minute. Um, basically, the argument is this. Just like somebody who is dark-skinned was born that way and they can't change it, I was born this way and I can't change it. And so basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to ride in on the coattails of the true civil rights group. But ask yourself this question. Do laws already protect the civil rights of everybody, whether they're black, white, male, female, homosexual, heterosexual? The answer is yes. What they're not wanting are equal rights. Ultimately, they're wanting special rights. Yep. Roughly uh, about two years ago, 
Uh, no, actually, it's been more than that. Now it's been about four years ago. There was a, a DVD making the rounds, and it's actually very, very still going on today. It's called We Are Family. 60,000 DVDs unleashed, children and grandchildren. show includes over 100 cartoon characters teaching children how to be tolerant of homosexuals. So you've got people like Elmo, Barney, SpongeBob, Sesame Street, Baron Big Blue House, Dora, Rugrats, Clifford, all came together to basically produce a single DVD that would teach this idea of, hey, it's all good, whatever, be tolerant. So at a very young age, your kids and, and grandkids are getting a twisted view of what is sexually right between a man and a woman. You add to that, now we've got universities that are offering scholarships exclusively for homosexuals. For instance, the University of California, Berkeley, $15,000 a year scholarship awarded due to her sexual orientation rather than her academic performance. Add to that, Sweden. You a straight scholarship, you go to jail. Oh yeah, yeah. If you had a, if you had a, uh, 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 basically a heterosexual normal guy scholarship, that would make like CNN news. They'd be all over you on that. In Sweden, Pentecostal preacher Ike Green was sentenced to a month in prison after being found guilty for having offended homosexuals in a sermon. Uh, 2003 sermon Green described homosexuality as abnormal a horrible cancerous tumor in the body of our society. He was put in jail for it. Coming across the pond. It's already across the pond. We got preachers, guys, in the state of Pennsylvania who now are taking out liability insurance because it is considered a hate speech crime in Pennsylvania. In other words, if you go to Pennsylvania and you speak out what the Bible says about homosexuality, you have committed a crime. That's a hate speech crime. Now, let's talk for just a minute about, ethically speaking, what society is trying to convince us of, what is the truth. If you were to listen to the media, which I never, ever, ever, ever recommend doing, but if you were to listen to them, you would think that homosexuals comprise 10% of the population. And yet, if you go by the Kinsley Institute, which is the one that kind of keeps up with sexual statistics, they would say it's 4%. We're going to talk in a minute why the number is actually lower than that. But when you turn on the TV, they're really throwing it out there at you. Now, think about this for just a minute. If the real number is less than 1%, how many straight characters should you have on a TV show before you have one homosexual character? How many? <laughs> Basically, you've got to have 99 straights for one homo. And yet, what is the reality? What is, what is on sitcoms, sitcoms now? Basically, it's like one for every five or one for every ten. Here's the bottom line. This is one of those dirty little secrets that our society doesn't want getting out. Uh, when they did the census in 2000, out of the whole population, only 0.42% reported being homosexual. 0.42. If we look at, uh, there was a very famous case that went on in in Texas in the year 2003. It's the Lawrence versus Texas sodomy case. In that particular case, the homosexuals themselves had to give their own numbers and say, hey, here's how many people this is going to affect. They used the, uh, the United States, the National Health and Social Life Survey, which found 2.8% of male, 1.4% of female population identified themselves as gay and lesbian. So even... If you go by the homosexual numbers, you are still less than 3% of our population. And yet they have got probably one of the loudest voices in our society. Now, 
Can we know, ethically speaking, what God would have? Absolutely. In fact, if you just had the book of Genesis alone, could you determine what was God's plan for human sexuality? Absolutely. These two verses, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, sum it up beautifully. Check this out, guys. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So this is after Adam can't find a help meet. He creates a male and a female. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his, notice this, father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So does the Bible give, just in the very first two chapters, a pretty clear picture of what God's expectations for family, for the marriage unit? Absolutely. His intent, whether people like it or not, is heterosexuality. Period. He doesn't throw in Now, here's the funny option. part. Go ahead. I was, I was just saying he doesn't throw in any other option. He doesn't say father and mother or father and father or mother and mother. No. Please, please. Absolutely not. Ironically, in our nation, we used to know that. This is uh, Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia. If you go back to look at how our colonies were set up, this is kind of a cool document. If you look at the top, it says, crimes whose punishments extend to life, meaning if you do this, you're going to give your life. You're going to die. And you notice there's high treason, petty treason, there's murder. Then underneath you've got crimes whose punishment goes to limb, meaning you're going to be dismembered. Something's going to be cut off, whether it be arms, legs, whatever. You'll notice in that sodomy is mentioned. In other words, if you committed homosexual acts, you were going to pay physically with one of your limbs. This is what the, uh, the United States Supreme Court said all the way back in 1986. They said prescriptions against that conduct have ancient roots. Sodomy was a criminal offense at common law and was forbidden by the laws of the original 13 states when they ratified the Bill of Rights. Guys, if you ever want to know where our nation stood, all you got to do is go back and look. And you realize that Connecticut, New York, Vermont, South Carolina, they had a death penalty for homosexual. It was a death penalty charge if you committed sodomy. Georgia, Maine, Pennsylvania, they, their penalty was life in prison and hard labor. I don't even think we have hard labor anymore. I think basically prisoners have argued for equal rights so much that now they sit around watching cable and they've got an exercise yard and they file lawsuits. They don't do hard labor. Here's an ironic point. The last time I checked this was actually still on the books. If you go online to uh, the Massachusetts government, general laws of Massachusetts under crimes, punishments, proceedings, and criminal cases, part four, title one, notice this. Crimes against nature, they talk about whoever commits a abominable, detestable crime against nature, either with mankind or with a beast, shall be punished by imprisonment and state prison for not more than 20 years. So basically, if you committed homosexual acts in Massachusetts, you could get up to 20 years for it. Why, why do I put that up there? Because of Massachusetts' support of gay marriage. Yeah. They're the first ones to legalize same-sex marriage, and yet their own general laws spoke very much against this. Here's the problem. Ethically speaking, guys, remember we're in an ethics class. For the last roughly, oh, 40 years, you got 28 states that have overturned their sodomy laws. 28 states. Uh, from 1971 to 01, said, okay, I know that we've got roughly 200 years of history that says that this is wrong, but now we think that basically you should be free to do what you want to do. 1986, the United States Supreme Court was still upholding the constitutionality of Sodom. They were still saying it's wrong. 
But then we got the famous Texas versus Lawrence sodomy case. On the screen, you see the sitting court that made this decision. 2003, June 26th, when our Supreme Court, for the very first time in our nation's history, said that homosexual behavior is okay. Now, let's look at what's happened since then. That was 03. November of 18th, November 18th of 03, Massachusetts says, okay, that's the case. We're going to allow same-sex marriage. May of 04, homosexual lesbian couples were granted marriage license in that state to do so first time ever in our nation. February of 05, New York begins to grant marriage license to same-sex marriages. You guys know that since that time, we've had five states that legalize same-sex marriage. So basically, the door is open. Ethically speaking, our society has said, you know what, this is not a, this is not a deal. So due to the militant minority of the gay community supported by social liberals, the view of homosexuality that has prevailed 1776 to 2003 has all been completely brushed aside. And yet, here's the point. Has God's view changed? Nope. Absolutely not. If you guys were to have to give a class on what does the Bible say about same-sex marriage, how would you do that? How would you go about setting it up? Start from the beginning. Okay. What else? Start from the beginning, then, then go to Matthew 19 where, where Jesus is talking about marriage. And he refers back to the beginning, so nothing's changed between creation and somewhere around 30 B.C., I mean A.D. Um, so we shouldn't expect for anything to change today. Okay. Guys, here's, when, I, <clears throat> when I teach on this topic, here's what I like to do, just because I think our society has become so lax on it is I will actually show God's view on homosexuality in all three of the ages, in the patriarchal age, the Mosaic age, and the New Testament. And the reason that I do that is to basically be able to say, look, God didn't like it in the patriarchal age. God didn't like it in the Mosaic age. Why do we think that God is suddenly now this God of love and grace, and he's going to allow it? And then I show what happens in, in the New Testament. So we go all the way back. Let's start, for instance, in Genesis 19. What happens in Genesis 19? Fire and brimstone. You got fire and brimstone. Now, uh, verses 4 and 5, now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. They called to Lot and they said to them, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. What is the homosexuals' argument about why God punished Sodom and Gomorrah? Inhospitality. Yeah. They say these guys were inhospitable. And yet, guys, if you really start looking at other texts, you recognize that's not the case. Verses 24 and 25 of that same chapter, look at what it says. The Lord rained down Sodom and, and upon Gomorrah, brimstone of fire from the Lord out of heaven. He overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew upon the ground. And they say, okay, well, that's just inhospitable. Well, Jude verse 7, speaking about this, says, Having given themselves over to sexual immorality, gone after strange flesh, they're set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Peter chapter 2 verse 6 talks about turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example of those who afterward would live ungodly. So can I know for sure that God was against this in the Old Testament? 
in the, in the patriarchal age. Absolutely. He burned down two cities because of it. We then move to the Mosaic Age. Leviticus chapter 18. Check this out. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's abomination. Nor shall you mate with any beast to defile yourself with it. It is a perversion. Do not defile yourself with any of these things, for by all these nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled. Therefore, I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. Brad? Yes? I find it interesting that, because the, the, any time you hear a debate now about the topic of homose about homosexuality or, or gay marriage, and an individual equates homosexuality with bestiality, it's just, oh, how dare you? Are you saying that homosexuals are like uh, those who practice bestiality and, it's, and it, there's just such horror that you would suggest anything like that? It's exactly what God suggests. Absolutely. Because once you've opened the door to something unnatural, guys, guarantee you, in your lifetime, you will see legislation put forth to allow pedophilia. I mean, it's coming, because it's the next progressive step. Once you legalize same-sex marriage, then somebody has can come along and basically say, hey, it's my right to have relations with a 12-year-old. Bernard Nambla is already fighting for that. Absolutely. And then you've got people who will follow them and say, it's my right to have relations with a sheep or a goat or a whatever kind of animal they do. I don't even know. Dog. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. So we're still under the Mosaic age. Can we know what God's view is? It says, if, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. We turn to Romans, to the New Testament, and we ask the question, does the God of today still view homosexuality in the same way? Paul, you're writing to Christians in Rome. It says, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Thank you. Likewise, also to them, leaving the natural use of women, burning in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, do not, do not know that unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites will inherit the kingdom of God. So obviously we can tell both Mosaic Age, Patriarchal Age, New Testament, God's view on this particular abomination. We ask the question, all right, what is he talking about when he, when he uses the word fornication? When you go back to the original and you look up the, the original Greek and you ask the question, you know, what is this word? How is it actually defined? It is actually defined as any of the behaviors you see on the screen, whether it be adultery, homosexuality, premarital sex, bestiality, bisexuality, bigamy, polygamy, or incest. Now, out of curiosity, that, because that Greek word, the Greeks were, were not uh, very, uh, they, were, they were pretty kind of out there sexually. Yes. Was this... Did they use that word porneia to refer to, did they, did they officially or, or culturally regard homosexuality, bisexuality, yes. etc., as being illicit? And then if, over time did that evolve into the, the sort of debauchery that... Yes. Yeah. yeah. Basically, it was one of those things where it was wrong, just like in America... And over several generations, uh, that became very relaxed. Because, guys, look at the list in front of you right now. Does our nation really, deep down, do we really frown on adultery? No. Nope. No. I showed you guys a, a website called Ashley Madison where <laughs> basically their, their tagline is, life is short, have an affair. 
What about homosexuality? Well, we got five states that have legalized it. What about premarital sex? Does our society really frown on premarital sex? No. Right now in high school, bisexuality is probably one of the biggest things going on. I and mean, kids are, it's, it's the new in thing for kids to be, to claim to be bisexual. And I think they're mainly doing it just for fun and for kicks. But the point is, we have relaxed, even in our own country, when you look at this list, we don't view all of these as truly hideous. Now, most people would still say bestiality is wrong. But when you look at some of the other things, it's kind of like, well, you know, it's not that big a deal. Uh, Mr. Herb? Yes, sir. I have a question about bigamy. I don't know. I'm looking it up here on the Internet. It says the criminal offense of marrying one person while still legally married to another. What? Yeah. What is that? I don't get that. How does that work? So let's say that, Quentin, let's say that you are married right now and you leave your wife. You decide you want to separate and you go to live in Wyoming. And you meet a young lady in Wyoming, and you court her, and you decide that you would like to marry that lady, even though you are not divorced from your woman here in Colorado. So now you got two women. Yeah, That's a now, yep. it is a criminal offense, yes, sir. <laughs> if it's criminal offense, how is it legal? That's, what, that's my question. It's not legal. But it's not legal. It is not legal. First right. Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless, the insubordinate, for the ungodly, for the sinners, for the unholy, the profane, for murderers, for fathers, murderers, for mothers, for manslayers, fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any one other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Now, Notice that. He says these are contrary to sound doctrine. For the longest time, the homosexual community tried to say that the Bible did not speak out against homosexuality. Nowadays, they've actually got a new tactic. Do any of y'all know what they're doing today? They try to say that the Bible has been misinterpreted. Okay, the Bible has been misinterpreted. How many of you know about the Princess Diana Bible? Yeah, it doesn't have those verses in it. Princess Diana Bible is actually put out by homosexuals. And they have literally just eradicated any passage that talks about homosexual behavior. So in other words, if you don't like what it says, you just cut it out. You basically get to do whatever you want to do. Brad? Yes. We talked about our attitudes toward these things and, and what we what we view as permissible versus those things we view as is impermissible. Absolutely, we're gonna uh, yeah. You guys are fixing that. Take a break. We're gonna come back and start talking about the genetics. Uh, you know, is is there a gay gene and what should be our response to it? Okay. I I think in the church we're scared to talk about it because the the gay community has basically come out so hard, so strong, that basically many pulpits have been silenced. Well, and there are a lot of preachers there are a lot of preachers who are, are confused and they assume there might be a gay gene. And so they don't want to come down on one way or another homosexuals. Michael, Chris, you had a comment? Yeah. The, we, we're I don't I don't know very many congregations that are that are not against gay marriage. But why is it that we look at we we we're willing to fight against gay marriage, but all the other forms of marriage that are not sanctioned by God that would fall into that category of fornication, we just sort of ignore those things or that's just sort of a wink and a nod, well that's just sort of the way it is. When we look at heterosexual immorality as being somehow less egregious than homosexual immorality. Does that make sense? So, are you, are, so basically, let me see if I can understand what you're asking. Are you saying, well, why is it in the church we'll preach out against homosexual marriage but not premarital sex or adultery? Right. Well, like, you know, Elizabeth yeah. Taylor gets married, you know, once a week, whether she, you know, needs to or not. Right. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. And we just sort of we'll let pick that up right there. We'll pick up right there, guys, and we'll come back.